All right, hello and welcome to the Middle East Forum Speaker Webinar Series and Podcast. I'm Stacey Roman and I will be moderating this discussion today. We are pleased to have Nitsana Darshan Leitner, the founder and president of Shirat Hadin, join us to discuss the battle to bankrupt the jihad. Ms. Darshan Leitner will speak for 15 minutes and open it up for questions. Should you wish to ask a question, please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen to type your question. And with that, I'll turn the discussion over to Nitsana Darshan Leitner. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm the uh, president of Jurat Adin, Israel Law Center. And um, it's a law center based in Israel, which we represent terror victims in lawsuits, ill actions against their organizations and their financial victims. Uh, for the past 20 years, we've been suing Hamas, Islamic Jihad, um, Hezbollah, Palestine Authority, Iran, Syria, um, North Korea, Arab banks, um, European banks, Chinese banks, Lebanese banks. We've been going after the uh, social media, Twitter, Google, and uh, Facebook, fighting terrorism in court. I will give you maybe um, just an update or some implications of what are cases really mean. And I will begin with the story of the Kawasma family. This is a prominent family that lives in Hebron in Israel, uh, a very respectful one, a very big one, they have tribes all over, and it's affiliated with Hamas. And one day, the, uh, one of the uh, men in the Kawasma family, met with two cousins and the three of them were sitting in his living room in Hebron, plotting to make a plan how to help the Palestinian prisoners that are sitting in the Israeli jail. Very quickly, they reached the conclusion that to help the Palestinian prisoners, all they have to do is to kidnap an Israeli soldier and then trade him and negotiate a, pres a, a prisoner release with the Israeli government. They're all the Gilad Shalit prisoner release that happened just a few years before was a huge success. 1,240 terrorists were released as a result of this deal. So they decided to go and kidnap an Israeli soldier. To, or to kidnap the soldier, they needed two cards, one card to kidnap the soldier with the other car to switch the soldier to it and to get rid of the first car, not to leave any trace of evidence. They also needed two M16s um, because the soldier might be armed. And they needed two pistols in case something bad will happen in the car. To purchase all of this, they needed 220,000 shekels. That's a lot of money in Hebron. 220,000 shekels, where the average salary is 3,000 shekels, you cannot make it in your lifetime. So they approached a non-for-profit organization, a charity organization called Arnur. It's sitting in Gaza. And this charity is affiliated with Hamas as well and funds all the terror attacks of Hamas and funds and gives a word to the families of the suicide bomber bombers and the prisoners of Hamas. So these three members of the Kawasma family approached Al-Nur, asked for 220,000 shekels and received it in cash. And then they went and bought two cars, two M16s, and two pistols. And then they went to kidnap the soldier. They went to Gush Etzion Junction, the closest place near Hebron, and uh, where the two of them went to the Gush Etzion Junction, and one went to find a place where to hide the soldier. It was Thursday night. They went to the bus stop. They were looking for a soldier, but it was no soldier around. 
It was the weekend, it was Thursday night, it was late at night. There was no soldier. There were three teenagers that finished school and wanted to come home. And these three teenagers jumped into the car of the terrorists, which caught the terrorists in a surprise. They did not expect three young boys jumping into their car. They got scared and they shot them to death on the spot. But then they continued with their plan. They drove away, they switched the boys from the one car to the second one, burned the first car and went to the location where the third terrorist was waiting and buried the boys in the ground. An entire country held its breath, looking for the boys for 18 days until we found them buried in the ground. The same terrorists that conducted and planned this kidnapping in his confession, after he was caught by the Israeli services, said that he had this same plan 20 years ago, but he could not execute it because he did not have 220,000 shares. This what money does. This how the terror organization utilized money to carry out their horrible attack. We represent the families of the three teenagers in Shurafadim. We filed two lawsuits on their behalf. One in the United States against Iran and Syria, and the other one in Israel against Hamas. The one in the United States was filed against state sponsored terrorism because the exception for the Sovereign Immunity Act in the United States says that you can bring a lawsuit against a state-sponsored terrorism if you can prove that this state funded the terror organization, they don't have any immunity, you can follow and sue them in court. We want a judgment against Iran. We are able to prove that Iran funded Hamas. Hamas carried out this attack. We have the um, a confession of the terrorists in court. We use experts, we want a judgment. How do you collect this judgment? So there are Iranian assets that we went after, bank accounts, deals, real estate that Iran has owned and we were pursuing them. Uh, bank accounts frozen from the day of the pre-Islamic revolution. Uh, real estate like the uh, building in Manhattan called 655th Avenue. Um, deals like the uh, Boeing deal when Iran signed a deal with Boeing to purchase 80 aircraft for $17 billion. We went to the court in Chicago where the headquarters of Iran, of uh, Boeing is. Um, we filed a motion for a lien, said that the uh, money that will go in this deal, Iranian money, should be turned over to us, not the money. The aircraft. As a result of our cases, indeed, we won billions of dollars in judgment and we are able to collect hundreds of millions of dollars on behalf of the victims. This case will not be an exception. In Israel, we filed, as I said, a case against Hamas. Today, it will be very hard to connect between the Palestinian Authority to Hamas. So all we could do in court is to prove the liability of the Hamas. That was easy. We won a judgment against Hamas. Hamas did not come to court and we won um, a monetary law judgment against Hamas. How do you collect this one? Hamas doesn't have assets, but we found out that Hamas actually has a $1 billion budget that it's fully funded by the Palestinian Authority. Yes, 
despite the gap and despite the fights between the PLO that controls the Palestinian Authority to Hamas, the Palestinian Authority funds Hamas. They give them money to support their offices in Gaza, to support the salaries of the employees in Gaza, to support the prisoners of Hamas that are sitting in the Israeli jail. We had an expert that came to court and testified that there is no difference when it comes to the Hamas organization between the benevolent wing to the military wing, to the diplomatic wing, to the government that they run. It's all one organization, Hamas. And we put a lien on Hamas money that it's held by the Palestinian Authority. We say the Palestinian Authority should not give its budget to Hamas, should give it to us. Palestinian Authority, you can imagine, did not come to court, did not admit or deny that they're holding money of Hamas. So under the Israeli law and under every law, the um, third party comes in the shoes of the debtor and now the Palestinian Authority owes us money. This judgment, the Palestinian Authority refused to pay and we went to the treasury in Israel. The treasury in Israel holds billions of shekels for the Palestinian Authority. This is the tax money that Israel collects and in the end of each month, transfer it to the hands of the Palestinian Authority. We're talking about one billion shekels a month. So we went and put a lien on the treasury in Israel. And now we are expecting them to allow us to execute their judgment and to transfer the amount to our hands. Unfortunately, this current government, the uh, outgoing government in Israel, refused to do it. They were a little bit scared about the fate of the Palestinian Authority. And I hope that the new government will respect the rule of law and respect the life of the terror victims and enforce the judgment. And I also expect them to understand that the Palestinian Authority gives $1 billion to the prisoners who are sitting in the Israeli jail. If they have so much money to pay the prisoners and they have so much money to pay the families of the suicide bombers, they can have enough money to pay the terrorists. Um, well, only have two more minutes, so very quickly, I'll tell you about another case. A case that we filed against the Palestinian Authority in 2004 on behalf of American citizens that were killed or injured by employees of the Palestinian Authority, Palestinian policemen, Palestinian security guards, uh, 417, the police uh, of Yasser Arafat. We filed it in the federal court in New York because I wanted to receive a judgment, not from the Israeli court, but from a federal court in the United States, granted by a jury that will come and declare who is responsible for the Intifada. Who is really steering the Intifada? And the case, the uh, Palestinian Authority hired a law firm from Washington, D.C. They filed a motion to dismiss. Their motion were denied. They ran discovering the position for 11 years. And finally, the case came to court. It opened in January 2015 in New York. And the Palestinian Authority had a defense. They said, indeed, they were our employees, but they were rogue employees. They did the attacks after work hours. It wasn't our policy to kill Israelis. It wasn't our policy to kill Jews. But when the trial opened, they found it hard to explain the jury. If they were rogue employees, how do you keep paying their salary until today? These terrorists who are sitting in the Israeli jail receives a salary from you every month. You promote them in rank every three months. You pay stipends to the families of the suicide bombers. 
you call town squares and schools and streets on the names of the suicide bombers. This is not how you treat our employees. This is not when your policy is against killing Jews. There was no surprise there then when the trial ended, the jury found the person authority responsible for all 24 acts of terrorism and gave us a judgment against them for $655 million. President authority was in shock. They fired their law firm from Washington, D.C., hired the new one from New York and filed an appeal. In the United States, in order to file an appeal, you have to post a bond for the entire amount of the judgment. The person authority claimed that they don't have $655 million to put in the court. So they reached out to the State Department for help and the State Department under Obama's administration, help. They filed a statement of interest in the court saying the Palestinian Authority is a national security asset in the Middle East. They wanted to keep existing to the side of the Israeli state. They don't want it to go bankrupt and they asked the court to be considered. The court was, instead of $650 million, the court ordered $10 million bond. And then the way was open for the Palestinian Authority to argue its appeal. They did not argue any essential argument except for one technical argument, personal jurisdiction. They said the Palestinian Authority is not exist in the United States and therefore there is no personal jurisdiction. And the Court of Appeals had a dilemma because on one hand, we filed this case based on the Anti-Terrorism Act, a law that allows American citizens that injured or got killed abroad to bring their lawsuit in the United States against overseas organizations. It's an extraterritorial law. On the other hand, the American Constitution demands due process, personal jurisdiction. But having in front of them the, the uh, statement of the State Department that's saying in these words or others, no matter what you impose against the person authority, they don't have the money to pay, the Courts of Appeal went and vacated the judgment. We went to the Supreme Court asking for a writ. Supreme Court, knowing that there is no pharaoh, they didn't know Joseph, approached the new State Department under Trump now and asked for his opinion. But the State Department came back and said, no, this judgment is unconstitutional. You need personal jurisdiction. And the Supreme Court rejected our writ. We did not stop there. We went to Congress told the Congress that there is a problem. There is a problem because we litigated this case for 15 years based on a law that they legislated. It was a well-intended law, but now was found by the court as unconstitutional. And they have to fix a problem. And the way to fix a problem is to reinstate personal jurisdiction, to come and say that if the person authority wants to continue receiving aid from the US government, they have to agree to personal jurisdiction. Congress changed the law, President Trump signed off of the law, and the Palestinian Authority came and declared that they don't want any financial aid anymore from the United States government. That's less than a year. After that, they came, they received the fund, they received the aid, and the Supreme Court ran down the case to the federal court to see based on the behavior of the Palestinian Authority, you can conclude that they are consent. I'm sure we'll ultimately win the case. But until then, I know from the security services in Israel, they told me that the Palestinian Authority's leaders could not believe how the little support they gave the terrorists before they attack, how the little money they paying them after the attack, turn in the end of the day to hundreds of millions of dollars in damages against them. This is our work. This is what we do. We fight on behalf of the victims. We give some measure or closure to the terror victims. And we punish those who kill innocent citizens on the street of Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. We come with a very clear message 
that there is a very high price to Jewish blood, that nobody can kill Jew and go without faith. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we have quite a few questions and one is from William Wolf. Uh, he asks, uh, how exactly do you get your funding? Is it through donations or, or a portion of the lawsuit settlements? Well, Shurabuddin is a non-profit organization based solely on donations. We pay the expenses on the cases and when the cases settle, we receive the expenses back. Uh, we don't get a portion of the case. It's only out-of-pocket expenses that we advance to the victims who have no ability to pay and they pay back once and if they win the lawsuits. Thank you very much. And while we're on this topic, uh, do you have a website that our viewers could possibly donate to? Uh, absolutely. Thank you for the question. Uh, the website is called uh, shuratadin.com or israelawcenter.org. Uh, just Google Shuratadin and you will find it. Um, and uh, we appreciate any donation possible to support our litigation on behalf of the state of Israel, on behalf of the citizens in Israel. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that information. Uh, Reuven Hawk asks, are you involved at all uh, fighting the six Palestinian charities designated as terror groups in, by Israel? Yes, the one that was al Haq that was designated by uh, Israel as a terror organization, which was closely affiliated with Hamas. We went and filed a lien on their money on behalf of our judgment against Hamas. Uh, we realize that if this, uh, if this organization, according to the Israeli security services, is considered to be an arm of Hamas, any money that this organization holds can be collected and enforced on behalf of our judgments. We are pursuing them uh, in this way, and we're also pursuing them in the United Nations because the main organization, al haq uh, that was designated by the Israeli uh, security services is actually the one that leads the delegitimization war, the lawfare against Israel in the United Nations. Um, we all know about the Appeal Commission. This is a committee that the Human Rights Commission of the Human Rights Council of the United Nations appointed to investigate Israel over the last operation in Gaza called Guardian of the Law of the Wall. And this committee is headed by an anti-Semite called Navi Pillai, which already found uh, Israel um, involved with war crimes and already expressed her opinion that Israel is an apartheid state and they are running a very crude investigation against Israel, not only for what happened in Guardians of the Wall, but also what happened in 1948, back then in the beginning of the state, if Israel actually has a right to exist as a Jewish state. And um, the, uh, this commission, this uh, inquiry, is based on briefs and papers that al haq this designated organization file, which was joined by 90 pro-Palestinian organizations. They joined the brief, signed off, and submitted it to the UN. So we're struggling him in two areas, the diplomatic one and the terror one. Thank you. Uh, Navet Basker asks, how often are you able to collect on the judgments? So far, we have received uh, $2 billion in judgments, and we were able to collect more than $300 million that went to the hands of the terror victims. We do it in a couple of ways. One is actually putting liens on third parties' hands that hold assets for our defendants for our debtors who won uh, the regime that we won the judgment against. So if it's an Iranian asset, if it's a Hamas asset, uh, bank accounts, real estate, um, and other of this sort, 
we just go, we put all in, and we, in a turn of a proceeding, take the money, take the asset. Banks that we have litigation against them, when they understand that they are going to lose the case, they settle the case out of court and they pay compensations. So does the Palestinian Authority. The Palestinian Authority already settled numerous uh, cases against the uh, uh, terror organizations and paid compensations. This is how we are able to collect. It's not um, systematic. You have to be very creative. You have to go and find where these organizations hide their assets, what the best way to go and collect it. It requires a lot of patience, a lot of creativity, a lot of thinking out of the box, but this is what we are. Um, our organization has been fighting this for 20 years and we've been successful due to the uh, mind that we put into these cases. Absolutely. It's great to hear that you've been so successful, but what are some of the biggest complications that you run into? Look, today, the uh, courts in the United States interpret the law in a way that makes it much more harder to uh, file cases against banks or against companies. Um, we, if, if before or all you needed to prove is that there is a bank that wires money to a, a terror organization in order to impose liability on this bank. Today, you have to prove that the bank cons conspired with the terror organization, that it had the same intention as a terror organization, that he wanted these victims to be killed by the terror organization. And this is obviously much higher burden. But I think uh, the obstacle that uh, we experienced in the past seven years was the, uh, our struggle against the social media, against Twitter, Facebook, and Google, where we find losses against them on behalf of terror victims for aiding and abetting terrorism. We claim that the, that the uh, uh, social media giants are providing services to designate a organization. And by that, they actually um, violate the Anti-Terrorism Act. The Anti-Terrorism Act prohibits any American company to provide any sort of services to a designated organization. A bank, for instance, cannot open a bank account to Hamas or to Hassan Nasrallah. But when we find these losses in the federal courts in the United States, the uh, Social media companies claim that they have immunity. Section 230 of the Communication Decency Act finds them as a neutral bulletin board. They are not considered to be publishers and therefore they have immunity. They cannot be sued in court. We pursued it and although we lost a lot of cases during the past seven years, we finally scored a victory in the Supreme Court of the United States who agreed to hear our cases. The Supreme Court issued cert, and for the first time, the social media companies will face this issue of immunity. The court is ordered, is going to check into the question whether the social companies should enjoy immunity or not, because today we all know that the Social media companies are not a neutral bulletin board. They are very involved with the content. They are very involved with their users and they should not enjoy this blanket immunity they enjoyed so far very long. Thank you, Anna. Sorry, one last question while we're on the topic of social media. Steve asks, might Israel win one battle at a time while losing the larger propaganda war with severe consequences, for example, US popular support? That's a very severe problem that Israel is facing, not only today, for the, uh, I think since the 1967, since the uh, Six Day War, when Israel turned from Little David to Major Goliath. The picture and the balance change. Um, we are not the victims anymore, the Palestinians are. And no matter how Israel tried to explain 
the history of the conflict and that we have a right to come back to our land and live peacefully and safely in the state of Israel, you can't really um, get the attention and the support of the world. And now, unfortunately, it's drilling very bad in the US. The US was our best friend, but the minds of the young people in the United States is getting poisoned by the BDS movement, by those who isolate Israel and alienate and call it um, a non-legitimate state. And the battle becomes much, much harder. We are, uh, we just started a new Israeli, I'm sorry, new uh, project to use the artificial intelligence and use technology that Jews are so um, keen to have in order to fight this battle on social media. We understood, especially in the last operation in Gaza, Garden of the Wall, where Israel won the war, as you just said, we lost the public opinion. And this is something that we have to fix. And I think we came with a brilliant idea. We're working with psychologists, with uh, technical uh, people, with uh, professors, with AI uh, um, technicians that help us with a special way to turn this time and to turn the image of Israel and to score higher in the public opinion war. Well, thank you so much. And before we go, can you tell us one more time where we can find some more of your work? Yes, yeah, so israellawcenter.org, israellawcenter.org. This is our website. If you Google Shurat Hadin, if you Google my name, Nitzana Darshan Leitner, um, you will find this website and uh, we have a Facebook page, we have a Twitter account, we have Instagram where you can find a lot about our cases. And uh, the best way I think if you want to keep informed is to uh, send us your email address, subscribe to our newsletter. We don't spam, we only tell interesting, fascinating successes, achievements and our acts that we go along during the year. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we've come to the close of our webinar. Thank you again, Mr. Sean Leitner, for joining us today. Thank you for the opportunity. Have a good night. You too. For our viewers, please join us Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern for an update with this, uh, Ashley Perry at Israel Insider. Thank you all for joining us. And I hope you have a wonderful day.